person and those who are connecting with us online as well. Um, this is Pleasant Retreat United Methodist Church. We're doing a one worship experience for the month of July and August now. Um, and um, today is our beginning of some of that. And so we'll be having one service at 11 o'clock each Sunday. Um, and we welcome again the opportunity, if you want to take it, to come and be in person for worship or to um, connect with us online. Whatever's best and um, um, the best choice that you want to make concerning your, your needs and your concerns. We don't uh, discriminate, but we're still connected as one here, and we hope it will stay that way. Um, in light of the recent situations, I am going to disclose to you now, again, as I did on my previous statement, that uh, we want to do what we can to avoid doing harm and to do what's good. And uh, we're not going to make that a political issue. We're going to make that more of a social responsibility issue for us as Christian people. And the idea here is that when we do certain things individually, uh, we help the whole. And so by practicing what we can control and doing the things that are important for us to take care of ourselves, we help our neighbors as well. And that being said, I just want to remind you, in the middle of all this pandemic, it's not just about face masks. It's about the fact that you're also washing your hands and using a hand sanitizer. You're taking, checking your temperature, making sure that you're not having a fever or beginning a fever and putting yourself in, in the proximity of others. You're practicing the social distancing that it takes to keep the distance from each other, whether you have a mask or not. And then wearing the mask is the other option that comes as a part of that as a way to protect yourself and protect others. I know it's inconvenient for all of us in so many ways, but the truth is we all have to make these decisions personally, and then it affects us as a collective group as well, our community. Uh, given the, the conditions of where we are right now, uh, the practice that we're having here at Pleasant Retreat United Methodist Church is that um, I strongly encourage you to use a face mask, especially if you're out and about out of your home and moving around. Uh, but at the same time, when you're here in our worship experience, if you're positioned in a place where you are in person and you're safe distance from others, feel free to take your mask off. Be comfortable at that point. Uh, you don't have to wear it for the entire service. But if you're in that case where you choose to, that's, just, that's fine also. The main thing would be when you're interacting with others or around others. And that's going to happen more when you leave here and get in your cars and you go uh, back between here and there. So um, I would encourage you to have the same practices that we've mentioned here in all areas, not just one. And we'll do all that we can to protect one another. So far, we've been good. But I can tell you now there are some that it's not just a number, it's a name that I can attach to um, the conditions of people who are fighting this. And, uh, and, it, and it raises more of an interest for me to do my part. So uh, please do what you can and know that if you come to be in person and worship with us, that that means that you're going to try to work with us to try to accommodate that need of protecting one another with our coming and going. Um, all that said, now I want to move back to our worship experience and welcome you for being here with us and pray today that God will speak to our lives. Today's a communion Sunday. And United Methodist Church, if you're not a part of our regular tradition, that means we practice an open table. And what we do is we take the communion as being an invitation from Christ himself and not from us at the church. And so whether you're Methodist, Baptist, uh, Presbyterian, pedestrian, whatever, um, I want you to know this is an open table. Christ uh, it shows no discrimination here. His love, his grace, his forgiveness is for all. And so all who desire a personal relationship with Christ uh, are welcome to come with that desire to reconcile with Christ and reconcile with one another. And uh, when the invitation is made, I hope you'll participate. Today, at home, if you're online, that means you'll need to have some elements to use for your communion experience. And maybe some breads and grape juice if you've been planning ahead. If not, find something and then have that bread and juice or whatever you can have there as your elements to consecrate and receive as part of the, uh, your um, communion experience today. I also remind you that as a way to keep us connected, we've been focusing on Christ which brings us together as one, the body of Christ. And the way we do that symbolically is with the lighting of a candle. And so I want to encourage you at home, if you have your Christ candle handy, if not, maybe you could find one, and uh, you'll light your candle now as an image and, re and representation of the ways that Christ is with us in our worship. Where two or three are gathered, there I am also. And what a graceful God we have that he would greet us in these moments always uh, if we just gather in his name. And I'm going to ask you to join me in a word of prayer now as we pray together. Father God, thank you for this gift of presence. 
just being here, being with us wherever we are. There's no barrier that can separate you from our lives. As Paul put it, we will never be separated from your love. And nothing will stand between us. And we take that to heart today in our worship, whether it's in our homes or in presence here or whatever the circumstances of life may be, we know that you are in our midst. And for that benefit, God, we take this moment as a joy to be in those who would worship you in spirit and truth. Let our joy be evident. Let our praise be evident. And let our prayers be in, in, in a state that we are truly giving ourselves and making ourselves available to you. And God, may your words speak to us and to drive and condition our lives in a way that we live differently than the way we came. Thank you for all the ways your presence today will make a difference. It's in Jesus' holy name that we pray. Amen. I invite you to follow now the direction of Otis as he leads us in our singing today. Um, I want to make one condition and a rule for this. If you're using the online bulletin that we put together for you to print out and use, um, I want you to know that there's a change here. Um, we've had a phone call this morning from uh, Johnny Russell that she was not feeling well and was not going to be here. And to his credit, Otis has been rehearsing all morning this morning, and he's going to lead our hymns, a uh, portion of our service today, with a guitar. So I give him kudos already and points for that, but I want to see you sing and support that as well. So let's stand and let's sing together our hymns. To God be cool. To God be the glory, great things he has done, so loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the light gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. listen in. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We, we have not loved our neighbors, and we have, have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ our Lord. Amen. Will you join me in a moment of silent prayer? Friends, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. And that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Just join. Father, friend, we have in Jesus.
Herman's did them. Shirley McFarland. The family of Cheryl Ellis. Joyce Evans. The Hammonds family. Diane Johnson family. A praise for our children and youth. Thanksgiving for our freedoms, strength for our nation. Heavenly Father, we stand in the midst of your greatness, and we know that all the things that we count as blessings are from your hand. There's nothing that we receive in the name of grace that isn't first born and given through you and by your love. So often we've overlooked, we've taken things for granted. But the very things that we complain about sometimes, the very gifts that we're given, that we have the opportunities that we have, that we have the freedoms that we have, let us not take any of these things for granted in our life. We thank you for our loved ones, our church family, all those who have been for us and with us in our experiences of life itself. We thank you also for the ways in which you have blessed us with children and youth to pray for and to nurture and to heal, to encourage and build up and to make into the worthy disciples that you called us to make them into. I thank you, God, for those who are not with us physically today, but are joining us in spirit, some outside of our church family even. We know that the hand of your love and your circle is much larger and we ask God that every life experiencing this moment with us will feel the nearness of your grace. That somewhere in their life they realize that they are blessed to be the child of God that they are. To be breathing this gift of life itself and given this day to worship and glorify you. God, you know us so well. You know everything about us that the very nature of you is to be though the one that would be in our midst, but also gracious enough to know the very darkest need of our soul. You see us as we really are, not just the way we present ourselves to you. And I thank you for the ways that your love will overcome any barrier we create and seek out the very nature of our life that needs you the most. And I pray for awareness in our lives to the places where we need you, God. Let us not be stubborn or prideful in a way that we would shut you out and not give you the opportunity to be the God of our life. And when we tackle the, the challenges of the church and our challenges that we face in our day-to-day -day experience as a community or as a people of God in a real world, God, may we then know also that we don't do this alone. But we are the body of Christ to nurture and care for one another. And you are the head of that body that sustains us and gives us an ability that's not our own. The power of prayer being one example, God. That when we declare, I will pray for you, it will truly make a difference, not just in the life of the one who hears it, but in the one who has created us and has this relationship with us, that that prayer will be heard and responded to by the very God we love. I thank you for the ways that you have already answered so many prayers. And I ask God that your church will continue to pray believing, not just with words, but in spirit. 
that your church would find the courage again to gather in that community that we are called to be and to stand together as the children of God before the God who loves us the most and loves us first. I pray that the, the messages of the gospel that has touched us becomes the, the desire that we have in our hearts to touch the rest of our world. That we would experience a love with you that would be so powerful that we can't stand the thought of not having it given to someone else who needs it the most. And so that same passion would come now for us, God, as we pray with you. The people of God, before God and with God, knowing that it's more than words, but the spirit of how you will work. And we follow this example that we were given through Jesus to remember the words that he taught us, to share them today as one, knowing that as we speak these words, we speak to the truth of the relationship of God to his children. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Our scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11. And we hear some words of Jesus that may challenge us in our faith and our living today. Hear this reading. Make sure I start in the right place. But to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to the infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. This is the word of God for the people of God. Your voice is high. 
sometimes it's just not fair that I get to follow those things. Thank you, Sally, and thank you, praise team. I think this church sometimes doesn't understand, may not fully understand the gifts that we have in our music here and the ways of uh, worship leading. Um, I'm thankful to be your pastor. Uh, today is the first Sunday in July, and for me, that is significant because it was the first Sunday in July, six years ago, that I was appointed to be your pastor and preach my first sermon here. Now I begin my seventh year with you, and you've heard everything I have to say, so I'm a little worried. But I want to share with you something that's significant to me, and it was the way that sometimes we can reach out to one another and offer words of advice and encouragement that are helpful. And I had a retired pastor friend, some of you have met him, H.O. Abbott, who, when he heard that I was appointed to Pleasant Retreat, uh, pulled me aside one day and said to me, Richard, I know what you're thinking. You want to make everybody happy. And he was right. I mean, I, it took me 26 years at the last church, but I certainly hope that maybe I could make everybody happy. And he said, and I want you to just feel a, a peace about it right now. You will make everybody at Pleasant Retreat happy. Now, a third of them will be happy when you get there, Another third will be happy when you stay there, and another third will be happy when you leave. But you will make everybody happy. And, you know, I take that to heart and know that sometimes it's just hard to, to understand how you can be everything to everybody. And I know Jesus struggled with this, but he knew his ability was far beyond what mine would be or yours would be. We're the ones that sometimes struggle with our limitations, our inabilities. Uh, we get prideful, we get a sense of that somehow or another we're supposed to always have the answer. And we have an opinion about everything, and we have an answer for everything. I gotta tell you, as a pastor, it's a struggle oftentimes when someone comes in your office and says, you're a pastor, let me ask you something. And I do not get that. It, it may not even be my office, it may be in conversation somewhere, but when someone starts a conversation with those words, you're a pastor, let me ask you something. There's an expectation there that's, that's coming, right? And what I've learned in my own humility here, because it was born into me from my seminary experience, um, is that I don't know everything. And I can't answer everything. And sometimes it's okay to say, I don't know. But let's find out together. Let's look for the answer together. You know, it's hard to do. When you're a pastor, you want to always be right. You want to always have the answer. You want to sound like you know everything. But there are times when someone will ask me something, and I have to be honest and say, you know what? I haven't read that passage in a while. Let's look at it. Or let, give me a chance to look at it and come back and have that conversation with you. Because the truth is, I'm not this person that walks around with all-knowing and all-everything here. And thank goodness God knows it. Sometimes there are days when I have to be reminded. And when I look at this passage, I feel encouraged a little bit in spite of the negative tone of it. Because Jesus is cut into the chase here a little bit. I mean, it's a pretty bold statement. When uh, Jesus uh, begins his prayer with, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. <laughs> That is a cutting statement. And I imagine he's praying that prayer in the midst of some Sadducees and Pharisees who are the all knowing, who have studied God's word. Their whole life has been brought into that context of being able to tell everybody the answer to everything. And he's saying, thank you that you didn't tell them. <laughs> but you're going to tell the ones that we really think don't know. In today's message, I want you to hear that there are times in which you think you know and you don't. And that's okay. Because that's where God sometimes does some of his greatest work. It's not in the things that we know, it's in the ways that we experience that some of the greatest work of the church takes place. I love this, because in this passage that we first started with in this chapter, verse 16, we see Jesus trying to offer for them an understanding of what the, the generation is like. He's describing it as the children who say, we did this and you didn't respond. We, we thought this and it didn't go the way we thought it would. Uh, things weren't what we were expecting and they're disappointed. <coughs> I'm going to pause here.
here and tell you that we've been praying for revival for a long time, haven't we? We've been asking God to make a difference in our world and change things, change us. And some people get frustrated because we go along that pathway and we start thinking he's not listening, he's not answering. It's not what we expect. We thought it would be measured in church attendance, not lives changed. We thought it would happen in the church, not outside the church. We have so many conditions and understandings of what we think and what we know, and we're discovering so often that God's way may not go exactly the way we want to predict it. And then he describes for them their history. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. They found a flaw in John. Well, there's something wrong with him. He's not doing the normal thing, right? Then he says, then the son of man, referring to himself, came eating and drinking. Remember the wedding? All right? At Cana of Galilee. And they say, look, he's a glutton. He's a drunkard. Afraid of tax collectors and sinners. How do we know? If the wisest among us are getting it wrong, how do we get to the truth? If those that think they know may not know, including us, how do we find what is real? Well, I love the way this passage wraps up for us because it brings us from this idea of understanding and knowing things to experiencing something. And I believe that when we do our faith that way, it makes a difference. A lot of us build our whole spiritual life around memorizing the scriptures, being able to quote things, being able, and sometimes even out of context, but still, we begin, we take pride in the fact that we've read it, we know it, we understand it, and we live it, we practice it, and we put everything on our standard. And we, we consider that the success of our faith, that we are spiritually right, but we have failed to really experience it along the way. It's a powerful thing to walk that path between knowing something and experiencing something. You know, when I was at seminary, you know, we, we had lots of theory about how to, to be a pastor in a church. I took a course called the Pastor as Administrator, and it was taught by a retired bishop who was showing us and teaching us, and it really was a class where he just sat on the desk and told us war stories of what he experienced in church. And how he wanted this to be available to us because a lot of us had churches at that time as student pastors. And we were wanting to say, yeah, but what about this? And what about this? And he would try to, to give us some, some ex and everything we did in there was based on experience, not what we know. Somewhere we all were admitting that there's a breakdown if I just go by what I know. Because I tell you, I was at seminary and I would attend chapel services and I would put together some of the best sermons in the world. And I would come back to my little church at Bassett United Methodist Church and I would try to give them what I had just gotten at seminary. And they would look at me with these blank looks on their faces. And they really just wanted to know, was I going to use the Bible? And, and could they talk about real life? Because it took me a little bit, but I realized finally that they weren't impressed with the knowledge. They were impressed more with me walking with them in an in experience. And effective ministry happens that way. And at the same way, a spiritual life is transformed that way. You and I can describe to people all we want about what church is, what faith is. We can talk to them about how wonderful Jesus is. We can talk to them about how we have experienced his forgiveness and we can share that with them, but when we are with them, when they experience it, it changes them. We don't invite them to that experience, we miss something. I've told you before about another pastor who was a mentor to me that called me up one day. I mean, he basically approached me at the end of the worship service. He said, can you come to my house and fix a computer problem? I said, sure. I went to his house. He didn't have a computer problem. He took me to the back room, and he told me, you preached a wonderful sermon today. But you missed something. I'm like, what? It was great. I know it was great. I was proud of myself. And he said it was awesome. People loved it. But he said, Richard, if you take a horse who's been ridden for a while and you lead him to a trough of water and you never give that horse a drink of water, have you helped that horse? I said, no. He said, that's what you did today. 
You preached a wonderful message. You, you shared an inspiration about this life and relationship with Jesus Christ. But you didn't offer anybody a chance to come and drink some water. And he was exactly right. The invitation to experience what we know, what I can share with you in my mind and knowledge, is the big piece to the Christian experience. And so I'm going to tell you today that a lot of us can read the scriptures and we can have theories and ideas about what it does, but until we are ready to walk into a life of experience with Jesus Christ, we don't fully know what's capable and what's possible in that relationship with Jesus. Now let's look at that last part of this passage. Verse 25, where Jesus says, at that time Jesus said, I thank you God that you've given this to, not to the, to the wise, but to the infants. And he says, because you're gracious and you're real this way. He gave some distinction there about what he knows, and it's through him, he's saying in those next verses, it's through me that people will learn and experience what they really can know about God. It's not going to be through all the words. It's going to be through the experience with Jesus. And then he sums it up with these words. Come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Okay, where did he say in there, I need you to have an understanding? Where did he say in there, I need you to have knowledge of what we're about to do? Where, make sure you use the right words. Make sure you have some history. And, under, and he's saying, I don't, if you're needing it, come experience it. That's a true invitation. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens. And I will give you rest. The good news in that is that you could be a pastor, or you could be a congregation member, or you could be someone who's never stepped a foot in the church, knows nothing about the church. And that same invitation will fit every life. And that same invitation to find rest in Christ is made available. I think sometimes we forget that. One of the things I've learned a lot as pastor is that whenever the invitation in our worship comes, it's an invitation to me as well. It may be a little delayed sometimes because I'm functioning as your pastor up here at this point in time. But when I get home and I process what was just done in our worship experience, sometimes I find myself to the point of really knowing that God was speaking to me too. And that he wants that same invitation to be mine. And he needs me to do the same response that I've invited you to do. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Learn is a, through a word of experience now, not through your knowledge. Take, that's the action. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. How do you know that unless you experience Christ, right? And you will find rest for your souls. It's not just a physical thing. It's that turmoil within us that needs rest. We need peace. I can go through all the functions that I need to right now. I can follow all the rules that you put in front of me. But I don't find peace until I can let go of it and feel that experience of knowing Christ. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's a contrast, is it not, to say those words from Jesus to a culture that has been told how hard it is to be obedient to God? where there were rules and consequences to everything you did that was an, a, a breaking of one of those rules, a consequence that was heavy and you lived in fear of God, more anxious about not getting it right than anything else. And then he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus can say that because it's broken down now to a very simple act. Experience it. 
give it a shot. Say yes. Someone approaches me and asks, what do I have to do to be a Christian? I don't need to give rules. I can certainly encourage a lifestyle change or I can encourage with some disciplines and things that will make life better and more stronger and open to the relationship that Jesus wants. But it starts with the experience. Say yes. Say yes and find out what God can do. One of the good things we celebrate in the church and the life of Christian discipleship too is that God knew that we would never get it all up here. <laughs> We've never put it all together and understand it. And it amazes me today how sometimes people will still say that they've got it all figured out. They could tell you that we're in the last days. They could tell you where we are. They've read the scriptures. They know every detail about it. And the world's going to... How do you know? How do you really, really know? If you chase that rabbit trail of knowledge and you want to know God only in the mind, you're going to be missing the biggest part of what is offered. That is an experience. And even the ignorant can experience. I may not be able to quote the Ten Commandments. And I may not be able to give you the gratitudes or tell you the scripture references. I may not be able to tell you how, what, how many days... I mean, how many Sundays a month it takes to be a regular member of the church? I may not be able to tell you what Methodists stand for or what Presbyterians stand for. I may not be able to tell you all the doctrines, but I can tell you about an experience with Jesus Christ. And I think there's a gift in that when Jesus makes it available to all of us. He didn't appeal to the, to the conditions of those that would know he can appeal to those that would experience. I heard a saying one time, it was this, you know, I was wrong once, but even then I was wrong because I thought I was wrong. We can confuse ourselves with that, couldn't we? And the only way we really know is when we experience. You may think you know the love, the forgiveness, the grace of God. But you're holding on to the, the fact that this or that is going to be an exception, and you're not sure, you're not certain. And the answer to that is experience it. Say yes. And let Jesus show you. Let God show you how far his love will go, how much his grace is sufficient, and how how great his forgiveness and ability to let go is beyond our own ability to forgive and let go. When I approach the table and I experience again the opportunities that mine in the communion service, I'm reminded again of how God didn't appeal just to a category of people, but he made his invitation to all. And he made it available to anyone who would want the experience. Now, we can go through the ritual, or we can go through the experience. So, the bait is on. When is it really communion? You know, uh, what kind of bread do you have? Is it juice from, you know, I mean, is it grape juice? Is it wine? Is it what? I mean, I'm, I'm not making a condition about anybody at home. You can... You're on your own with that. But, um, but those standards are all out there, but it, it becomes the experience when our lives are open to Jesus and we say, you know, I just want to know you. I just want to know this love. I want to feel it. And I think you'll find that God will reveal his best in those moments. I'm going to invite you to join me as we consecrate together this time of communion and then walk into our life and experience with an invitation from Christ himself. Remember again that as the people of God, we've already committed that prayer of um, confession, and we have experienced that forgiveness that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And in that, we may claim our forgiveness even now. 
but now I invite you to this experience. Will you join me in prayer? God, it is right and a good and joyful thing that always and everywhere we give thanks to you. You are the creator of heaven and earth, and you formed us in your image, and you breathed into us this breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love has remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity. You made a covenant with us to be our sovereign God. And when justice, and you spoke to us through your prophets who looked for that day when justice would roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. When nation would not lift up sword against nation and neither shall they learn war anymore. And so with your people on earth and all this company of heaven before us, we ask that we could praise your name and join that hymn of their praise, that you are the God of power and might, and that heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. Lord, holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when he would save your people. He healed the sick, he fed the hungry, and he ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, and you delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. At his ascension, you exalted him to sit and reign with you on your right hand. It was on the night in which he gave himself up for us that he took the bread and he gave thanks to you. He broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup and he gave thanks. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my cup of a new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts of Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. As we proclaim the mystery of our faith, which is that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast this heavenly banquet. This we pray for your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. I'm going to invite those who are assisting me to come forward and be served. And those of you in person with us today will be served as you leave the worship service today. Um, as you go out, you'll stop, you'll pick up one of these packets, and then you'll uh, be able to receive it. Remember, there is also a prayer after communion that we normally practice, and if you're at home and you don't have that, please just remember to give your thanks after you have received these gifts of Christ. The body and blood of Christ, broken and shed. Let me come to the invitation for each of us. And I want to emphasize to you, I'm not saying knowledge is a bad thing. But the knowledge of the heart is just as significant as the knowledge of the mind. And the dilemma for Jesus' day was that there were a, a host of people who lived off of the knowledge of the mind and understanding of the word 
but they had not yet experienced the true word, the life of Christ. And that's my prayer for you today, that you will be willing to lift up again that experience that you've had or that you need to have with this life in Christ. I'm going to ask you today to hear the invitation that's before us, to know that there is a gift of God in this experience with him. We're going to stand, we're going to sing and closing hymn together. And I want to ask you again to claim in your heart. If you're uh, a Christian, go ahead. If you're a Christian, you can maybe then reclaim Christ in your heart today. And if you're needing that experience for the first time, I hope you'll contact me, uh, message me, whatever's needed, and let's follow up and talk about how do we begin this journey of experiencing Christ, not just knowing him in our mind. Let's stand and sing together.